Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Martin Edelman. I would like to uh, welcome you to my talk about Groovy in the Atlassian ecosystem. A uh, couple of words about me. Uh, so by day I, I'm part of the script runner server team at Adaptivist. Um, later on it will become clear what script runner is and who Adaptivists are. Uh, by night and in the evenings um, I tend to hack on Jeb uh, and I'm project lead of that, um, of that library. I've been using Groovy uh, for quite a while now, um, pretty much nine years. Um, I really dig open source software. Um, I love contributing and working on open source and I have contributed to uh, many uh, projects in the uh, Groovy ecosystem over the years. And you can find me as uh, Martin Edman on Twitter. So why, why am I giving this talk about um, a closed source product um, which is used in a closed source ecosystem, Atlassian ecosystem, so the clo closed source product is, is ScriptRunner, the closed so close source ecosystem is the Atlassian ecosystem at a Groovy conference. So um, basically for two reasons. Uh, first of all, um, I don't know if you are aware, I myself wasn't aware uh, before I joined uh, Adaptivist that uh, Groovy is a big thing in the Atlassian uh, ecosystem. Um, I'm going to talk a bit later about why it actually is a big, big thing, but um, I want to raise awareness of that fact. I think um, people in the Groovy ecosystem, in the Groovy community should be aware of that. And secondary, I would like to talk about a number of cool um, low-level low level Groovy language features that we are using um, on ScriptRunner and um, which help us to make the product better and to get a bit of a competitive edge um, in, the, uh, in the marketplace. So who are Adaptivists? Adaptivists are operating solely uh, in the Atlassian ecosystem. Uh, we have two branches of the business. One branch deals with services, so we provide consulting, uh, administration, operations and training for various uh, Atlassian products. Uh, mainly it's Jira, but we also, uh, we also have um, um, quite a lot of work with regards to Confluence and, and uh, Bitbucket and other um, Atlassian products. Uh, and the second, uh, the second part of the business deals with uh, products, um, which are extensions or add-ons or plugins, name it how you wish, um, for Atlassian applications. Um, and um, this part of the business is, is where I'm based at, and I'm going to talk today to you about one of our products that is uh, heavily using uh, Groovy. We also are hiring, so if you are interested in working with Groovy on a daily basis, um, Adaptivists are a company that you should probably consider. Uh, there's a, a bunch of us from Adaptivist here at the conference. Uh, we have a booth, uh, you might have noticed that. Uh, just if you want to have a chat about opportunities, um, just come and say hi. We will be um, around for the three days of the conference. Uh, you can also go to adaptivist.com slash careers. Uh, there's a bunch of opportunities over there uh, listed. Um, all in all, I consider uh, Adaptivist to be a, a very sociable, relaxed um, bunch. Uh, we are remote fr friendly. Uh, and uh, we are lucky enough to have an unlimited holidays uh, policy. So um, a number of, of cool things, I would say, um, probably worth considering. We're always on the lookout for, for good developers, so um, come and talk to us if you're interested. Given that um, one of our most important products, scri uh, Script Runner, is um, using Groovy uh, so heavily, I think it only makes sense for us as adaptivists to get involved uh, in the uh, community, in the Groovy community, and give back to the community a bit. Uh, so that's the reason why we are gold sponsors of, <coughs> of GreatConf this year. 
Um, we are also uh, members of Friends of Groovy, uh, Friends of Apache Groovy Open Collective. Uh, we are, I believe, the biggest contributor to date. Um, if you don't know what that is, the Friends of Groovy uh, Open Collective, uh, it is basically an initiative started by the community to, to try to uh, <coughs> sponsor a bit of Groovy development uh, by donations uh, from the community. So um, if, you, if you're benefiting from Groovy and if you like donating, I would encourage you to, to get behind it because I think it's a great in initiative. Um, and also, while we are doing, we are dealing with um, you know a closed source ecosystem of Atlassian applications, uh, and we are building closed source products. We are friendly to open source, and uh, we we encourage our um, employees to uh, to not only use open source uh, projects but also to contribute back to them. So what is Script Runner, the product that I've been talking about? Um, basically, um, it, is, it is an extension for various Atlassian applications. It started as one for just for Jira, but now we have um, extensions for, uh, we've got Script Runner versions for Confluence, for Bitbucket, for Bamboo. Um, and also, um, because of how Atlassian applications are structured, they have a division between server sites, Atlassian applications, the ones that you run yourself on-prem, and clouds Atlassian applications, the ones that are being run by Atlassian. Um, we have versions of Script Runner for both of these. So it's, it's a suite of, uh, of extensions for, uh, for Atlassian uh, products, and essentially what it allows you to do is running Groovy scripts in um, built in uh, extension points of these products. So in Atlassian products, you have various hooks where you can, uh, where you can attach um, codes. Um, usually it is um, um, Java code via um, a, a plugin uh, that you wrote for, for, that, for that Atlassian product, so for Jira, for example. And with Script Runner, you don't have to actually write a plugin. Uh, you can just use Script Runner and write some Groovy codes uh, and hook it up into that extension point, and uh, off you go. So it's kind of like a meta plugin. So um, it allows you to do things that you would be otherwise able to do with with a plugin, but without actually having to write a plugin yourself. It's just Groovy scripts. Um, and it allows you to automate various tasks. Uh, it allows you to customize and allows you customize your your Atlassian applications and extend them. And when we when we're talking about automating, uh, one of the things we do internally uh, in the support process for Script Runner is when um, a support request comes in, uh, an issue is created uh, in Jira. Uh, a support engineer recognizes that that issue is actually uh, a bug and uh, it will need to um, uh, have a developer assigned to it to, to, to fix that issue. So uh, another uh, issue in Jira is created, a developer specific issue and the uh, support issue and the developer issue are being linked together. When the developer issue is done with, so when it's fixed, um, we have a script runner script that um, is triggered at that point, and it comments on the support issue uh, linked to the de de development issue. Uh, what this in, in turn does is it notifies the original um, poster of the support issue that the, um, that the, the bigger problem, the bug, bug has been fixed, and that they are, they are then aware that if they upgrade to the next version, their issue will be fixed. So um, we don't have to do anything. All we do is, as part of our normal process, as a developer, we close an issue because we fixed the bug in Script Runner, and then we have this um, this pipeline set up, which basically means uh, which, which basically notifies the original poster uh, of the support uh, request that it's indeed been f been finished. So, as a team, we don't have to do anything with that. Um, 
customization. Uh, an example here would be uh, that before you can close an issue as fixed, uh, you, uh, you have to assign a version to it so that um, then when you look hist at historical issues, uh, you know uh, which uh, fixes went out as parts of which, which release. So uh, you can write you can you can write uh, a validator in Groovy to to basically uh, check if uh, the issue before it's allowed to transition if the issue before that issue is allowed to transition from one state to another to fixed for example um, certain conditions are met for example a version fixed version is, is being assigned to it um, and finally extensions so uh, in Jira you have a concept of custom fields which are additional form fields that you can put onto uh, the issue screen. Uh, and uh, you can have a Groovy script backed custom fields. Uh, and one of the things you might, for example, do with, uh, with script runner is add a custom field, which shows the time that has elapsed since uh, an issue has been transitioned into, say, uh, in progress uh, state for the first time. So why, why was Script Runner created? Why, why just not write uh, a plugin? Because Atlassian applications allow you to write plugins anyway, so um, why, 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 why coming up with this? So basically, uh, in 2008, um, the original author of, of Script Runner, uh, Jamie Eklund, um, had this problem where he, he, he found that he would, like to have, he would like to create a number of small extensions but the amount of boilerplate and work that he had to create um, and had to be involved with uh, when he was creating these extensions for, for, uh, for Jira at the time was just, um, was just making him not efficient at all. Um, so he, uh, he figured out that um, it would be basically better to have something where you only work on the business logic that you care about. So this um, in this case uh, uh, a groovy script would um, would constitute that logic and not have to deal uh, with all of the boilerplate and and um, glue that you need to um, have in there when you are uh, creating a, uh, an Atlassian uh, plugin um, just just to be just to be more productive and uh, just to keep um, things um, easier for himself, um, uh, yeah. It's there's there's also various other um, considerations here. Uh, Atlassian um, extensions for Atlassian products are created as OSGI bundles, uh, so it is quite complicated topic, uh, and you have to you have to know what you what you're doing with it. And with Script Runner, this is kind of hidden away from you, so you never er, never have to. Um, be even aware that OSGI is being used, and um, that helps for people who are less um, less less technical. What's the impact uh, of Script Runner? Uh, so uh, we have over twenty thousand active installations of Jira for Script Runner server. Um, there are also installations of uh, Jira for Bitbucket and and uh, sorry. Um, Script Runner for, for Bitbucket and Script Runner for uh, Confluence. But we estimate that 20 to 30 percent of uh, Jira servers, server installations out there in the wild are, are using Script Runner. So um, it's quite possible that um, when you last created a Jira issue, you weren't even aware that um, some um, groovy code has been executed uh, as part of your request to create, to create that issue. And it's also important uh, for the Groovy community because it raises awareness of Groovy. Um, Atlassian ecosystem is, is quite big. There's quite a lot of people um, using, uh, using these tools. Uh, and uh, it is a good audience, I think, um, uh, for, for, for making them aware of a language, language like Groovy and um, um, you know, benefiting from it. So why was Groovy 
why was Groovy chosen as the scripting language uh, for Scriptrunner? And this is back in 2008, to give you some context. Um, so there are certain constraints when you think about um, dealing with uh, Atlassian applications. Uh, first of all, they all run on the JVM. So uh, when selecting the scripting language that's, uh, that you're going to use for, for a product like that, you want something that runs on the JVM easily. Um, secondly, you want something that uh, seamlessly integrates uh, with Java. So uh, you are probably aware that it's super easy uh, to, code, to call Java classes from Groovy without uh, need for any data, um, um, without a need for uh, any data structure uh, transformations, um, because Groovy is reusing the same data structures as, as Java is. Uh, you can just basically call as if it was. It doesn't really matter if it was implemented in Groovy or Java. You can just, just call it. And this is important because, again, all of the uh, Atlassian APIs that you will be calling quite frequently from, uh, from these scripts um, are, are written in Java. They are Java APIs. Um, obviously, it would be good uh, for uh, for the chosen solution to write to ra run these scripts quite easily, and uh, with Groovy, uh, it's super super easy to to take a, a script and, and run it at run runtime, compile it and run it. Um, Groovy has also made certain things uh, more intuitive. Again, we're talking here the users of Script Runner are people who are less technical. Uh, quite often, they won't be developers. They will they will be tech savvy, but they will be like admins of Jira um, and people people like that. So it being intuitive um, is important. Uh, one example here is the double equals operator, uh, where in Java that operator means identity, uh, whereas in Groovy it means equality, which is probably less surprising for, for someone who is um, who's non-technical. Um, and uh, finally, um, we all know that that Groovy, one of the one of the strong points of Groovy is the fact that uh, you can you can write less code than than in Java, and it so it's easier to grok and um, just l less boil boilerplate. Um, so I've already mentioned that, but the script runner users quite often are not developers. Uh, and they are dealing with code, so uh, we want to help them as much as possible uh, with with their day-to-day -day tasks, and and do not ask them to have to be aware of all of the intricacies of um, um, of uh, Atlassian product extensions and how exactly they work, and and just simplify it for them so that they they just have the script uh, as short as possible. Uh, uh, and, and deal with that. So we're using various um, features of Groovy, of, of the language. Uh, so we are using uh, static type checking. Uh, we are using compilation customizers and AST transformations uh, to make life of uh, users of Scriptrunner um, easier. Um, at this point, I should probably eat my hat because uh, I remember in Probably 2015, I was having a conversation with uh, Cedric Champot, who is the author of uh, Static Type Checking in Groovy, and questioning him, like, why, why are you implementing this? What's the benefit? Um, and I just couldn't see, I just, I w it, it, it was hard for me to see what the benefits are. But clearly there are, and, and um, this shows that um, sometimes, um, sometimes you're just not aware of the possibilities of of uh, of things that there are uh, there are that are there uh, that, are, that are out there um, in the language and uh, you just need to wait for an opportunity for the right opportunity to to arise to uh, to use it. Um, yeah. So what do we use static type checking uh, for? Basically, to help the users to spot mistakes in their scripts. Uh, the scripts in Script Runner are not statically compiled, they are only statically type-checked. And um, in this example over here, on the slide, you, uh, you have a condition script, which obviously should uh, return a Boolean. So um, um, you wouldn't want to be assigning 
the value here to the estimate, you would want to be using a double equals. Uh, the error here is, of course, because there is no set estimate method on the issue. The issue is a type that comes from the Atlassian API. Um, and um, static type checking allows us to show uh, that to the user that most likely they have made a mistake over here and they, sh they should change their script. Um, static type checking uh, is extensible in Groovy. Uh, and for example, over here, um, uh, you see that there is an issue variable uh, that gets injected by script runner into the context of the script using script bindings. And by default, static type checker wouldn't know about it. But you can, you can write um, an extension for the type checker to inform it what the type of uh, issue variable in this case is. Uh, and we're going to look um, at an example of that later on. Uh, and then the static type checker will know that actually there is no um, you know, set estimate method on the issue. There only is uh, a get estimate method. Another thing that uh, we are doing um, thanks to, we are able to do thanks to static type checking uh, is to show users, um, okay. Uh, that was un unexpected, to show users deprecation warnings. Uh, so um, what, we want to what, what we want users to be aware is that they are using, um, they are using deprecated um, Jira APIs in this case. So when they later on potentially update their version to the next major, things might break. So we want to uh, warn them early that um, um, they are using deprecated methods and what the alternatives are and what they should be using. And the way this is done is basically at build time, we are extracting deprecation information from the Javadoc. Uh, and then at runtime, uh, when we are traversing the AST tree uh, of the script, uh, we, um, we detect calls to, uh, to uh, deprecated classes and, uh, and methods, and we basically show the information to the user. Um, one of the cooler, um, one of the cooler uh, things that we've recently introduced uh, to, uh, to Script Runner are code completions. Uh, again, this is something that we achieved thanks to static type checking. Um, what you can see over here that is that um, uh, the code editor knows uh, the type of, uh, of the variable issue and it also is able to suggest uh, properties um, and methods that can be called um, on, on this variable. So um, if we were if the users of, of Script Runner were developers, they probably wouldn't uh, wouldn't use this as the, as their development environment. They would go to their IDE, and yes, we have a plugin for IntelliJ uh, that will help you to develop scripts uh, more efficiently. But as I said, quite a lot of developers, uh, quite a lot of users of, of Script Runner are non non developers, and they don't they aren't familiar with IDE, so. This is what, what they would use on a, um, uh, on a daily basis. And for them, it actually is a big, big help <laughs> to be able to, um, to get out to completions. Um, it just makes, makes their life easier. Um, and the nice thing for us about this is that we don't, uh, at Script Runner, we don't really have to do any you know, groovy parsing or any lookups of methods. Um, that are a, that that are uh, available in a given context. It's all already there in the AST, and we basically have to uh, pull it out of the of the AST that's being passed to us, and then pass it to the browser to to display it to the user. So um, this is um, this is very cool for us because it didn't really uh, it didn't really take a lot of effort uh, to implement. So let's, uh, let's have a look at a very simple um, example of a static type checking extension. OK. 
Okay. Switch to presentation mode. It's looking good. Okay. So, um, as I said before, it's relatively easy um, to execute a script in um, a Groovy script at runtime. So, what we have here is we create uh, a Groovy shell. We set a number of um, uh, variables on the binding uh, for, for the shell, for the, for the script, and then we simply evaluate a script uh, that we pass to the method as a string. Um, when we are creating Groovy, uh, a Groovy shell, uh, we are able to uh, pass uh, a compiler configuration. And in this case, we have a configuration that adds an AST transformation customizer uh, of typed check. And this type check is the, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, is this is the annotation that you can use on your classes in regular Groovy code when you when you want your classes to be to be uh, statically type checked, um, we don't want use our users in this case to do it. We want all of our scripts uh, compiled and executed using uh, using this Groovy shell to be type checked. So that's why we are using this this customizer to do it. So um, with when we when we are running running a script uh, with uh, static type checking enabled this script, um, so basically calling um, info on an instance of a SLF4j logger, and we're passing the instance um, of, the, of the logger um, as, a, as, a, as, as part of the binding. Um, if we don't have, um, you know, by default, basically, uh, we're going to get an error from the sta static type checker because the static type checker knows nothing about the log variable over here. It's, it's just undeclared, yeah? But because we know that the, the, the instance of the log variable will be an SLF4j uh, logger instance, uh, we can actually add um, a type checking extension. Uh, so basically the uh, type checked, uh, the type checked uh, annotation takes a list of extensions um, that you can pass in. So we can pass um, an extension uh, that will inform the uh, type checker about the log variable. And all we have to do is um, extend from an abstra abstract type checking extension. And uh, there are different ways of doing this. You can also write a Groovy script. There is a DSL uh, for writing static type checker extensions. But in this case, I just decided to write a class. Uh, we just override uh, the handle unresolved variable expression um, because our log variable will be unresolved. We check that the name of the, of the unresolved variable is log, and then we inform the type checker uh, that the type of this variable is, is logger. So uh, then when we do that, so when we use this static type checking extension, uh, the script actually compiles uh, and executes um, the way we, we, would, e we would expect. And the tests are passing. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to uh, to the second uh, group of uh, features that we are using. Uh, from from Groovy that are helping us to make lives of our users easier. Uh, so um, I called it compilation customizers, but they are also um, they can also be seen as um, AST transformations. So uh, during the compilation of uh, of Groovy code, Groovy compiler allows you to uh, expose as a number of hooks that you can you can plug into and um, and use um, to actually change the code programmatically, so the code provided by the user, you can change it programmatically to do other things, to extend it, to change it. Uh, and uh, we have we have two extensions um, in like that in in Script Runner. 
So as I've mentioned previously, um, Adaptivist, uh, sorry, uh, Atlassian uh, products uh, and extensions for Atlassian products are built as OSGI bundles. So for those of you who are unaware what OSGI is, it's, it's an early attempt at what is now the um, uh, Java module system introduced in, uh, in Java 9. So basically it allows you to export packages at certain versions from bundles and other bundles can import these packages at certain versions. So the goal here is to have class path separation between different bundles so they, um, they, they don't share the class path. And the second goal, I think, is to uh, lower the, um, the footprint related to, um, to, to class loading. Uh, so basically, if, uh, if multiple bundles have a dependency on Groovy 2.5.6, they can basically just, instead of bundling the Groovy inside of themselves and it then being loaded multiple times at runtime, they can just reference this other bundle that, uh, that um, uh, exposes Groovy and then it's just faster and, and it uses less resources to use these classes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so basically OSGI um, uh, plugins uh, for um, Atlassian products are OSGI bundles, and we it's quite complex, and we don't really want uh, users to have to deal with that. Uh, but there is a there is a, there is there is a use case where, for example, they know that there is this other plugin uh, that they have installed in their application, and they would use they would like to use classes from that plugin. So um, to do that, they can basically use the with plugin annotation, uh, and what it will do is. When we are compiling the script, we look how we look for that annotation, and if we find it, then we basically add a requirement from that script uh, on this other plugin. So uh, the classes from that other plugin are being uh, being made available um, to to the script, and uh, the script can use these classes. Um, another one, uh, another uh, annotation is uh, plugin module. So think about it as basically an inject, um, the regular regular inject when, you, when you're doing injection. So apart from exporting packages, OSGI bundles can also export, um, can also export services. And if you want to use an instance of a service provided by another bundle, in this case provided by an, another uh, Atlassian uh, product plugin, uh, you can basically inject it using uh, plugin module annotation. And again, uh, this is this is done at compilation time uh, by us, transformed into the code that actually injects the service, so that the user doesn't have to doesn't have to deal with all of the intricacies of the process. Okay, uh, so uh, let's have a look at another example. This time of a compilation customizer. Um, something simple, I selected um, a customizer that uh, adds an import, an implicit import to the script. Okay. Okay, so um, another, maybe not really real life example, but you probably by now have heard f about the standard char sets uh, class introduced in Java 7, I believe. It exposes a number of constants for, for char sets. One of them is UTF-8, um, and we just have a script that, um, that returns the name of the char set for the UTF-8 char set. Uh, by default, if we just take a script like this and we try to run it, we're going to get a missing property exception uh, because the UTF-8 variable is not defined. Uh, but we can, in Groovy, we can actually um, change the compilation, com compiler configuration 
to implicitly import certain uh, packages, classes, um, um, members of certain classes. Um, and we can do it using a compilation customizer. So um, how, do we, how do we register a compilation customizer? As I've shown you below, uh, before, um, running scripts can be done with, uh, with Groovy Shell. Uh, and uh, as part of the constructor call for Groovy Shell, you can pass in a configuration for the compiler. And basically, uh, there's a method on the compiler configuration where you can basically add um, customizers. Uh, to the configuration, and they will be used uh, as part of, um, of the compilation pro process. So over here we have an um, implementation of, um, of the comp compilation customizer that adds um, um, imports, uh, implicit imports to all of the scripts that are being um, compiled when this uh, configuration is used. Uh, so first of all, what you have to do in a compilation customizer, you have to tell the compiler at which point, uh, at which phase, in which phase your customizer should run. So there are different phases over here. Um, we have plugged in our uh, customizer in the conversion phase because in the semantic analys analysis phase, uh, the uh, classes are being resolved. So we need to add the imports before the classes are being re resolved. Otherwise, um, uh, our customizer, uh, compilation customizer, would have no effect. So we plugged it into the conversion phase. Um, and then uh, a, a compilation customizer is basically a class that um, implements this call method. It is passed uh, the comp compilation source uh, which holds the AST, which is the AS, uh, which is uh, which is the abstra abstract syntax tree, which basically holds a representation of the code uh, and a method on AST. And there is a method on AST that basically allows you to add um, a static star st uh, star import um, based on a given class, and we do it here for the uh, standard char sets. Um, and when we have this compilation customizer in place and it's being used, then the UTF underscore eight variable is known. Uh, it's resolved to, uh, to a constant on standard char sets class um, and the script runs as expected. Okay, so um, this is pretty much all that I had uh, prepared uh, for this talk. Uh, are there any questions? Mm-hmm. So uh, you will need to, first of all, you will need to install um, Script Runner, which is an add-on for Atlassian uh, products. Uh, it's a commercial uh, product. Uh, you could give it a, you could, you, could, you could evaluate it for a period of time for free to see if it works for you. So um, after, after you've done that, uh, then in the administration, you will need to have administration access um, sorry, uh, you, 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 you need to be an admin. You would need to have an admin role on the instance in which you have installed the product uh, because only admins are allowed to write these scripts. Uh, it's not open to all of the, all of the users, of course. Um, so uh, you would then go to the um, admin um, console of, of Jira and uh, Script Runner adds uh, additional configuration screens uh, in that area and um, it in these screens, you can basically configure. Um, uh, you can you can you can write these scripts. Uh, so um, you could, for example, react to. Uh, you could add, add listeners, uh, which would execute when issue is is transitioning from one state to the other. Right. So if it goes from um, 
uh, ready to in progress to in review and to uh, to done at each point um, in this process you could add a, um, uh, a trigger for a for a groovy script to be executed to do something like for example prevent the transition or notify some other system um, the world's your oyster pretty much because it's just code and you can you can do anything Yeah, there are multiple ways uh, that you can do it. So one of them is uh, on, on one of the scripts, uh, on one of the slides over here, uh, what you see is the, uh, is what we call a script, a script console. Um, and uh, in that, um, basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a web form in which you can write your Groovy script. Uh, you can also see on this uh, slide that there is a there is a bit of uh, there is a tab. Uh, you can. No, these these screens these screens are actually from the um, admin uh, area of Jira. The screenshots of this is this is not this is not IntelliJ. It's it's a web form that you see over here. You can. Uh, uh, will I be able to? Where's my Oh, you cannot see it. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, you, you can you can see the form over there basically that it's a it's a web form. So you can either write it in in the web form or there's this other tab uh, called file, and you can basically upload uh, your files. If you're an admin, uh, you will pr most likely have access to the uh, to the box, and you can you can. Uh, configure where what we call script roots are, and so these are like directories where you can store um, uh, scripts, and you can then upload your scripts in there, and then instead of having to type them, you just go to the file tab, and and you can select um, the from the available files that are on your system. Yes. Um, they are always run as admin, but you have to remember that um, they are written by admins. So they, uh, admins, should ensure that whatever they are doing and however they are writing it, they are checking that um, whoever is triggering the script has the right uh, authorization to do certain things, and Atlassian provides APIs to just do that. So you know who is the user that triggered given script, and from there, instead of um, just using the APIs as you, as an admin, you pass the, the current user to these APIs, and then they filter down of what's available and, and what's visible. So it, it is a security concern, uh, that's for sure. Uh, that's why only admins are allowed to write these scripts. Um, and um, you know, it's uh, as with any tool, uh, you have to be cautious uh, what you do, and you can you can hurt yourself um, all the way to taking down the instance, your instance, if you if you write, um, you know, a script that spa spawns multiple threads and, and and stuff like that. So it's your responsibility to um, to make sure that it doesn't happen. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you. <laughs>